Stevie, I'm going to make you host so you can run the question. All right. OK. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to say good morning, but I guess it's noon now. <laughs> so good afternoon or right at noon. Um, so I am Stevie Colby. I'm in uh, physical sciences. I teach physics and astronomy. And my co-host, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, you know, I'm brain for now. computer science. So we're glad to see all of you here today. So we're going to be talking about how to use Zoom to its full potential. And if you want to go to the agenda slide, yep. we have a list of topics here and things that we would like to do. Um, so we'll start with the annotate one. We were going to do that while people were arriving, but we had a little technical difficulties with the poll. So uh, we'll go to the annotate one. So the annotate's pretty fun and actually can be quite useful in the classroom well, in the Zoom classroom. So at the top of your screen, you should see uh, you are viewing Stephanie Colby's screen, and then there's a view options. And if you click on that, then you'll find annotate, and you get a nice little menu of things that you can do. So you could do things like draw, and you can start coloring in. So let's just do a group coloring project here. Just play around with it, have some fun. Yeah, so our whole point of bringing this up is first to just kind of get us warmed up here. So again, you can follow the directions on the side. But this is, of course, a fun thing that your students can start doing. But we can also discuss some interesting ways that annotate can really help with interaction during your Zoom sessions. Um, but I think it's good to just get a, a handle on how it works. Um, I can see that you're all getting the colors and drawing there. There's also next to that, you should see something that says stamps. Um, and those are like little hearts or little stars or something. You can try those too, because those work pretty well when you want students. There, I got, Hannah's got some hearts going in the corner there. Awesome. See if you can, yeah, there's a check mark. Check marks are really, there's a, a stamp for a check mark. These are really great when you want to put up a question on the screen and sort of ask people, you know, hey, what do you think the answer is? And they, you can say, you know, put a check mark or a heart or whatever the case may be in your, uh, desired answer, or what you think the answer might be. Right, and that's how um, uh, how I've used it in the past as well as, you know, whether you have something kind of like today where say, you know, what do you want to talk about or how are you feeling this morning, things like that. It's a way to get some of your students to interact that maybe don't have their camera on, don't have their audio on. Uh, it's a way for them to actually engage in the Zoom room in their kind of quiet way. So I think it does help bring out some of those um, shy students that maybe aren't going to come on your on the camera or on the microphone to interact a little bit. And so you do have the option. Um, I don't actually can't remember if from the participant view, but at least from my view, I can see who's putting what on there. Um, so you know, I can see it's like just a random little blip. It will say like Michelle put this or Hannah put that. And so you can see that students are interacting if you're curious who's putting what there. But it only lasts for like a little. I don't know, like three seconds or so, and then goes away. So it's not something that you could use to initially record what they're doing, but it's something that you could look at to just say a brief, like, oh, okay, people are here, they're interactive, they're getting going, things like that. And of course, as the instructor, um, you always have the power to um, disable this tool, this annotate tool from students. It's not something that's always available because I have run into the problems before of students go a little crazy sometimes. So you can always disable this tool um, and not allow them to use it as well. And you can clear student annotations as well. Um, I was responding in the chat. Some people were having trouble finding the option. Um, uh, you may have just opened the Google or through Google Chrome or something. If you use the web version of Zoom, there are a lot fewer features than if you have the full application installed. Um, but I have seen Annotate on Android and on iPad. So I think most platforms have it. You just may need to install the full application. Yes, that's a great thing to bring up because at least I remember Google Chrome was not allowing Annotate for a while for some students. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay, so I'll go ahead and so I can clear it as, as the host. Um, so I'll clear everyone's so you can easily do that. Also, if you are doing this as the instructor, you could clear your own, just your own and things like that. And of course, you know, don't catch everybody's um, people draw the last minute. And you can also save a screenshot so that you can post it for students later. Okay. So really how we want to run this um, 
talk, I guess today, is more of a discussion of really wanting to know, we don't know where you're at. You know, maybe you've used Zoom, you used Zoom all last semester, maybe you really didn't use Zoom and you want to get more into using Zoom this upcoming semester. So really, this is where we would like Kelly to, oh, sorry, I guess I do it now, pull up the poll. Um, I'm going to launch this poll. So a poll is a essentially a survey that you can give to the audience in the Zoom room. And this essentially, what we want to know for this poll is what do you want to talk about? <laughs> what do you want to focus on? So we thought we'd run this session more as a discussion of, you know, do we want to talk about certain topics in depth? Do we want to kind of get an overview of the main features of Zoom? So select as many of these as you would like. So on your screen, or maybe if you didn't pop up above, you might check down at the bottom, you should see a poll that's available. And so you, once you've answered, um, you can't undo your answer from what I've learned from students. So choose wisely <laughs> when you select your choice. We have a lot of options here. These are just the options that Tasha and I have kind of come prepared to talk about, but we are open to other topics as well. So there's a topic on here that if there's a topic that you'd like to discuss that you don't see on this list, please put that in the chat window and we'll make note of that and we can easily start a discussion on those topics as well. So I'll give you all a minute, look at these different options, see which ones you would like to select. You can select multiple topics or all of them. Um, and we'll just give you a minute or so here to figure out what we want to discuss. I see Dora has her hand up. Oh, I have a logistic question that's probably much easier than it seems, but I have a really hard time um, with my stylist and starting to annotate. And then if I touch something or change something like the color or text, it disappears. I can't get back to just the pen. So I have to like close it out and restart it. Does that make sense? Is there a way to not make that happen where I just can always use my pen? So I found the, the annotate is not the easiest thing to use. And it, I actually have a a pen that I use on my uh, my slides, but I actually prefer to use the annotation in PowerPoint and draw, draw my PowerPoint slides. And so I, when I use annotate, it's to get some student feedback and I'm not looking for a lot of precision. Okay, okay. Yeah, I noticed in PowerPoint it works wonderfully, um, mm -hmm. but I don't really know. Um, I just like sometimes mm -hmm. I have the pen automatically yeah. and I can make a note on it and then it disappears. Like I, I can't get back without closing it out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, yeah, it's, that, it's not perfect. Not it's not designed as the primary feature. And so I think they probably have spent yeah. enough uh, time developing it to get it to sort of work, but maybe not be okay. perfect. I was just thinking it was something simple that I just didn't know how to do. No, I don't. Yeah, I think it's just what Tasha said. I think it's just not finessed okay. that much. It's just, I think, for more a quick glance type thing. Thanks very much. Yeah, so to get to some of the questions in here, um, Hannah's asking, do you have to create the polls ahead of time? You don't have to create them ahead of time, but I find it a lot easier to create them ahead of time, depending on what you're using them for. So we can kind of go into depth about how you create them and what we use them for. Yeah, and you can absolutely make them in the moment. Um, you have to exit, you don't have, Effectively, you're gonna have to go outside of Zoom, not like leave the Zoom session, but you know, you can't do it within the Zoom application that you're in. You have to kind of leave the Zoom application on your end to make a poll. You won't actually have to close the Zoom session, but it is a little bit separate, but I can show you how to do that. Yeah, I'm a little bit, I like to have everything ready to go. Um, <laughs> so I don't make them as much last minute. Um, I find it stressful to be like, oh, type this up really fast, but it's easily something you can do in the moment. So I'll, either way, I'll show you how to make the, the polls and you would do it the same way in the moment as you would ahead of time. And if you're okay. looking for something that's just a quick, do you feel like you understand this or not? You can have students use reactions. There's the yes, no. And if you want a third option, you could tell them to use slower or faster or something like that as well. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and I'll share the results with everybody. So that's an option. You don't have to share the results with the whole class, okay? But I usually choose to. So this shows you what everybody has decided we wanna talk about. So I'm just gonna make a quick note. So we're gonna do pinning, asynchronous uses, uh, multiple screens, and then should we require students to use videos? Let's see. 
Okay, so those are kind of our main topics. So I added polls on there as well. So we've got, we'll talk about the polling feature. How do we make those? How to do spinning and spotlighting. Um, asynchronous uses for Zoom. Breakout rooms. Sorry, I didn't write that one down. Breakout rooms and then multiple screens and screen sharing. Okay, and again, if there's anything else you want to discuss, feel free to put in the chat window and we'll keep on top of that as well. All right, so Anyone? you can stop Sharing the topics it. that uh, didn't get voted for, they're still in the slides and the slides are linked to from Catalyst. So you can find some information about these in the slides. And if you want more information, please feel free to contact us. Okay, so I stopped sharing our Google Slides because I'm not going to share, um, actually, let's share the same thing. Just exit out of that. I'm going to show you how to make a poll. So. I'm going to my Zoom, like I was in here getting it for Kelly earlier. So I went to just Zoom, right? So your Zoom account on the web. Okay, so when you log in, of course, you know, you'll log into your Zoom account. And I'm waiting for it to give me my options. There it goes. So my account. So when you click on my account, this is gonna show you all your options, okay? So when you come over to meetings, this is where you would actually schedule a meeting, okay? So that's actually one thing, one of our options that we have on there is actually how to schedule a meeting. So you can schedule your class sessions in Zoom or your office hours or whatever you're doing through Zoom, through the web, or you can you can schedule them through Confer Zoom. But either way to, to um, make the settings that you want and to create the polls, you have to actually do that within the Zoom application through the web. Okay, so here was the talk that we had scheduled for today. So if I click on this, this gives you all the options for this meeting. Okay, so this is like today's meeting. So if you scroll way down to the bottom, here's where you have the option to create polls. Okay, so of course I had added this poll already, but let's add a new one, you add a poll. And there is a limit of how many options you can have. Okay, we actually discovered that. I think we decided there is only 10 limits of answer choices. But of course you would type your question in, you know, answers, we'll just type in C, D, and then you save it. Okay, and it's really as simple as that. And once you save this, it creates this poll down here. So again, we've talked about whether you wanna do this before or after. I will even, you can actually title these. So if I go back to how do you edit this, you can title them. So sometimes I have like a question on, I teach astronomy, so like the sun, I'll label out the sun. That way when I'm in my lecture mode or discussions with students, I say, oh, I wanna ask that question now, I can quickly come and see, oh, the poll for the sun. I know which one that is. I know what the question is. It's a quick, easy glance. So that's all you have to do to make the poll now to actually bring the poll up. So I'm outside of Zoom at this moment, right? Once you go back to the Zoom session as the host, write down on your list of everything you have, like your stop your video participants, there's the polling feature. And when you open that up, you'll see your list of polls and you can launch each of these different polls and they'll have a little drop down list that you can see each poll and launch those polls for your students. Now, this is all you have to do in the moment as well. You just need to go to a web browser. Of course, you wouldn't actually be sharing this with your students. Make your poll and then launch it right during your session. So one thing that I have found pretty useful um, using polls for are things like conceptual questions. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to stop sharing the screen. So with conceptual questions, I tend to ask these throughout my lectures with students if I'm doing a, an, a synchronous Zoom session. And so these are one of the reasons that polls work really well, right, is to type these questions. And now I'll, I'll admit that <laughs> I was typing my Zoom questions um, just like we did for you guys with the full answers in there. And one of my colleagues actually asked me right at the end of last semester, why don't you just put A, B, C, D? And of course, that takes a lot less time for the answers for the poll and students can just answer A, B, C, D and they see what the question is on your Zoom screen. So that works out pretty well. So that's the kind of very basics the with polls. Go ahead. And then you can reuse the question. You don't have to type in so many questions. Exactly, I was spending, I was spending you know, 15, 20 minutes before class typing in all my conceptual questions as polls. And that was silly once I realized I can just type A, B, C, D. So learning experience for me on that one. 
Are there any other questions about using the polls? Okay. Stevie, do you want to make me co-host? Then I can yes, help I just lower that. hands and things. How do you make people co-host and then take away their co-host? It's right in the participants <laughs> view. So when you see the list of participants, when you hover over their name, it mm -hmm. essentially allows options. It says more. When you click on more, that has the options to make host, make co-host, remove co-host. Oh, okay. That mm -hmm. more is where you remove it? Yep. Okay, thanks. Because I had to like urgently make a student a co-host because I was having Wi-Fi issues. And then later we couldn't figure out exactly how to change it back. So yeah. I could share my screen. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking right now, it technically says withdraw co-host permission. Withdraw, okay, withdraw. so more. Thank you, thank yeah. you. You can also mute participants. So if there's a student who suddenly has a lot of noise in the background, rather than asking them to mute themselves, you can just go into participants and click mute on them. Mm -hmm. Or if you see them highlighted, you can uh, mute them from the pictures as well. Okay. So I'm looking for our pinning and spotlighting faces. That was our, our next request on what we wanted to talk about. So pinning and spotlighting. So this works really well in terms of what the student wants to see on their Zoom screen. Okay, so Typically you have the person that's talking is highlighted. So once they start talking, their face comes up, right? You can change that view. And this works really well, especially if you have um, ASL interpreters in your classroom, you might wanna pin or spotlight those interpreters for your students, okay? So what this does is spotlighting keeps one view, it keeps the face camera for everyone. Whereas pinnings is individual, the student can decide to pin certain people and we can, can now actually allow multiple pins. What that means is, for example, is if you had two, let's say ASL interpreters and you wanted to see both of them, because they take turns sometimes, especially if you have a long class, the student can pin both of those people and you as the instructor, so they get to see all three of those views, okay? And that works well, no matter who's talking and how it's Stevie. I just pinned Stevie, so you should all be able to see Stevie. And so this actually works, students can pin on their own, but to show them effectively when you hover over the little face icons in Zoom, those little three dots, okay, click on that and that's where you have the option to pin, okay? And so yeah. you can let students do this on their own. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just used the wrong word. I had spotlighted Stevie. So as host, you can spotlight and that, design, that uh, designates who other participants see. But as a participant, you can pin, which just affects your own view. But they're very similar. They're, they're like flip sides of the same coin. Yeah, and, and pinning doesn't affect if you're recording. So for example, if you go back and view this recording later and you pinned Tasha, but I'm talking, <laughs> you're gonna see me in the recording because recording, because the pinning is only for the user themselves, it's not for the session, which is run by the host. So the host, their face is going to come up. That's the view that the recording is going to see, which is different from the student's view. So this is a very personalized aspect of Zoom that works for the participants individually. Was there any specific questions beyond just how to do that about pinning or spotlighting? So there's a question, where is the spotlight option? You only have that option if you are the host or the co-host. So you won't see it as a participant right now. Um, so how you're doing it is the same way that you do pin, the three little dots. It's just right under where the pin option is on this view, it says spotlight for everyone. So effectively I can change or I can make Tasha the spotlight and now she's spotlighted for everybody. I see you as spotlight, Stevie. Oh, because I have myself spotlighted. Never yeah. I removed myself. I removed myself as spotlight. Now I'll spotlight. Absolutely. Tasha, so you may have noticed Tasha. that the video view changed as well, regardless of what your preferences were. And where you go to get the pinning is you hover over the 
pictures of people and you choose those three dots and then in the drop down menu you'll see pin. And the host has to allow multi pin if you want to be able to pin more than one person, which you'll want to do if you have ASL interpreters in your class. Yeah. More questions? Okay, so our next option of topics here, go to our slides. We had breakout rooms, so I'll go ahead and find that one. Oh. My cat's starting to do his zooms around the houses now. So. <laughs> okay, oops. There we go, breakout rooms. Okay, so yeah, let's so do breakout, a... breakout rooms are lots of fun. Mm -hmm. um, and they're a great way to get students to do small group work. <clears throat> And this, these screenshots here, I, I had to get a second tablet and give it a name because I didn't want actual student names all over the place. But you can have Zoom automatically group students or you can manually put students into a room. Or, and this is really great, they introduced this last term, you can let students choose their own room, which is really great for you not taking a lot of time to manually move students around. So I would often have uh, like a Google Sheets or something that I shared with students and I would have put their names in it ahead of time before class. And I'd say, you know, here's a link to the Google Sheets. Everybody go look, figure out which room you're supposed to be in and then go to that room when I say it's time for breakout room. Um, you can put a timer on a breakout room so that students have a limited amount of time and the breakout will end automatically. And at least when I wrote this slide, which was at the beginning of last term. And you could not add more time after starting a breakout room, but you could close a breakout room early for a time breakout. One caveat I wanna add there, Tasha, about students adding themselves to breakout rooms, they do have to have the most up-to-date version of Zoom. Well, actually it was like an update ago. Yes. But if they haven't updated their Zoom, um, they will not be able to add themselves. Now we're kind of hoping that, that was actually a couple updates ago that students will update their Zoom, but you might just suggest that to your students early on in the semester to get the most up-to-date version of Zoom. That way they can add themselves to the breakout room. And that's a really good point, but if you've asked students to update, most students will have updated and you may end up moving one or two students around and they can let you know. Even if they're not updated, they can always move between the main room and the breakout room. So I like to leave my main computer on the break on the main room. And then I have a second device. I have an Android tablet that I'll send around to the different breakout rooms to visit students inside the breakout rooms. And I don't do the multiple computers. I just do everything on one screen, but it, it does work either way. Yeah, so we've got a few more slides about breakout rooms if you wanna to go to the next one. Are there any, before I move on, are there any questions about how to actually make the breakout rooms? If you want us to kind of go into that in more detail, you know, raise your hand or give us a little thumbs up or something, or if you feel like you're comfortable with that, we can kind of move on. Uh, so, Hannah's asking Tasha, where do you set the timer? Yeah, so when you click to make a breakout room, there's an options button and you can allow participants to choose the room, allow participants to return to the main session at any time. You can automatically move everybody to the breakout rooms. And then just after that, it says breakout rooms close automatically after, and then you fill in how many minutes. And then there's also a countdown after closing the breakout room. So when you say, hey, it's time to close the breakout rooms, there's a countdown timer before everybody gets kicked back to the main room, which is nice for people to be able to um, go ahead and wrap up their conversations, but can get kind of frustrating if it's like a 60 second one. I, I changed mine to the uh, 10 seconds because that was enough time for students to wrap up. I was like, okay, you know, I'm sending you a breakout room. I'm bringing you back. I'm sending you, I'm bringing you back. And I was doing that so frequently that 60 seconds was too long for my class. But if you're sending students to a breakout room two or three times during class, 60 seconds might be a good amount of time to say, hey, you know, this is like a warning. We're gonna be closing this breakout room type of thing. And then they get 60 seconds before they get kicked back to the main room. Does that answer the question? Let's see. Allison says, if we have time, can we see how to display the stopwatch during a break? Um, what do you mean by that? Hey, sorry. 
um, I um, kind of silenced my phone. Um, so there was like a stopwatch counting down because I'll take a 10 or 15 minute break with my class because we meet for so long. And then we'll take like a coffee break or whatnot. And I loved being able to read the countdown. Um, okay, yeah, during the keynote yesterday, uh, the speaker used the countdown timer and she embedded a YouTube video in her slide and just had that shared on the screen. Is that a slide? Okay, but thanks, I'll figure something out. I'll Google it too, and thank you. Yeah, I've seen my kids' teachers do that as well. Okay, so before you send students to a breakout room, it's really important to prepare them because once they're in the breakout room, the message all breakout rooms uh, just doesn't have a lot of power. And you don't wanna send somebody off to a room and then have them go, well, I don't know what to do, right? If you give instructions to your class and you say, do some work in groups and you're in the classroom, you can see the confused faces. But if you give instructions to your students and you send them to breakout rooms, you don't see them anymore unless you happen to go into that breakout room. And the last thing you want is for students to waste five minutes waiting for you to happen to get to their breakout room to figure out what's going on. So make sure they know what they're supposed to do. Give them clear instructions. Have them ask questions when you're still in the main room. You might even want to pull them to make sure that they're ready. Um, you may want to give them instructions on a Google Doc or some other shared document because they won't see your screen anymore. Once they're in a breakout room, your screen share is gone. So provide those instructions elsewhere. Give them a link from Canvas. Uh, stick a link in the chat if you need also to direct them to Google Slide, Google Doc, Padlet, whatever is appropriate. But be consistent so that your students know where to find that information. And you may also want to consider assigning group roles, even if you don't do that in the classroom. It's really important in a breakout room that students understand what is my role, what am I supposed to be doing? Because otherwise they'll sit there for two minutes until somebody finally takes charge, right? And so you want to make sure that everybody has, uh, every group has a leader and some other suggestions that may or may not work for your class, a reporter who re reports back on the discussion, um, a researcher who looks things up in the textbook or online or wherever, a timekeeper who's making sure that um, you're keeping track with what you're supposed to be doing, that type of thing. And so when I told you earlier, I would have an Excel document that told students which room they were in it also told them which uh, role they had for that day. And we talked about the roles at the beginning of the course and I talked about them throughout the course as well. And I think one important role that I've used, especially when I teach labs, um, is having one student that's designated as the person to share their screen. So like Tasha had mentioned, if you were working on a Google doc or for me, I use a, a lab program, that that one student, their role as she's talking about is to be the screen share person. That's their role. And that's actually, I found that really important because like she said, students will sit there and kind of stumble over who's gonna go. If you have one person that their job is to show their screen and show the activity, it gets things moving uh, a lot faster. That's a very important uh, point. Do make sure though that that student is on a laptop or a desktop computer rather than a cell phone because the screen sharing is a lot easier that way. Yeah, and in general, I mean, depending on your choices, I find a lot of these features on Zoom get harder when you're on a tablet or a phone or things like that. So do be considerate as you're thinking about using these different features, what you might be asking your students um, to have in terms of equipment or making sure they understand that when they try to do a Google slide and be in a breakout room, that their phone might not be able to handle that and for them to engage appropriately. So do keep that in mind that you let your students know what they're gonna to need to be successful in these activities you're providing. Yeah, actually the last time I tried to create a breakout room from my Android tablet, I discovered I couldn't, you had to be on a Windows or a Mac, not an iPad, but Windows or actually Mac to be able to create a breakout room. Any questions about this? So in terms of monitoring your breakout room, that ask for help button, I find to be essential. So you do have to direct students to this button, but when you're in a breakout room, it's just one of the options on your Zoom menu as a participant. And what this does is allows the, the breakout room participants to essentially call on you, no matter where you are, whether you're in a different breakout room or whether you're in the main room, it allows students to say, hey, we need help. Um, and it stays on your screen until you either say dismiss or you go into that room. So I really recommend that you tell students 
to use that ask for help button because I find that more beneficial than the broadcast message because Tasha had mentioned that that message feature it does it. I think it's obvious. It pops up on the screen and like shows, hey, you have a message. But just like Tasha said, students don't seem to notice it. Um, so if you're saying, hey, don't forget to answer question five or something, most students don't see that. But that ask for help, I tell them don't even hesitate. And you can pop in and out of breakout rooms and answer those questions. Um, and that works out very well. Yeah, I actually found that the broadcast a message to all was so not working for my students that we started using pronto for communication when we're in breakout rooms and one of the students roles was to monitor pronto so somebody was in charge of making sure that they were keeping an eye on it in each of the rooms that way if there was a message i needed to send to everybody i could and i wasn't limited in how many letters were allowed in the message and the message didn't disappear after a while if i needed to give them a link they could actually click on it um, I did find ask for help got a little frustrating from my end when I had like 20 breakout rooms with pairs of students in it and five or six people wanted help at the same time. You know, the last person in line just didn't understand why it was taking me 10 minutes to get there. And so what I did is I had a Google Sheets that was the raise your hand sheet and students would put their name, their breakout room and a summary of their question. That way other students could go ask for help as well. Um, so the ask for help button shows up when you are in the breakout room. So we're not actually in a breakout room right now. So you won't see ask for help. One um, thing that a colleague of mine uh, who's in here, Jen, have found out with breakout rooms, and I'm telling you as just an FYI, that several times when we've had breakout rooms and you're going between breakout rooms and you're trying to go back to a main room, I have had countless times where effectively I get kicked out of Zoom. And as the instructor, it, it's scary because <laughs> all of a sudden you realize you're not in the Zoom session, right? So you log back into Zoom and what you'll find, and I've heard both, both of us have found this, is that you're no longer the host either. And that can be a little frustrating because all your students are in breakout rooms and you have no way to reach them because you're in the main room by yourself. Now, the great news is if you just wait, Zoom does figure it out. <laughs> it actually will finally figure out your ID or whatever it's looking for and that you are the actual host, but it can take up to three or four minutes sometimes. So just you know, take a deep breath, be calm, your students will be fine. But I had that heart attack way too many times until I realized if I just wait, it actually will figure out you're the host and you'll get all your host privileges back. So. Just an FYI, if that happens to you as you start to use more breakout rooms, it's okay. Um, you will get that host privilege back again. That's good information. I have not had that unfortunate experience. So I guess it's I've been lucky. Um, but maybe also I haven't had that experience because I've joined Zoom from a second device that I've also been logged in on. So the few times that I did get kicked out of the session, my second device just became host. Oh, so right. that, that may have been. made the difference for me. But I do find that having that second device is nice for multiple reasons, right? Um, students can come back to the main room if they have questions. If a student gets uh, to class late or they get kicked off and they need to join back in, you can talk to them and get them where they need to go without having to say, oh, wait, sorry, group that I'm talking to. Let me go back to the main room and help somebody, right? And, and there have been a few times when I just haven't been able to start talking to the people in the main room because I'm talking on the secondary device and I see somebody log in and they're just sitting there and then they just leave because they don't know what's going on because it looks like nobody's there. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to have something in the main room to be able to get uh, students moving along. Um, so to, and to then, kind of, sorry, go ahead. ahead. I was going to link off of that. Why don't I move us into multiple screen slides so we can continue that. <laughs> kind of multiple device, multiple screen. Okay, yeah, so- yeah, Dora, go ahead before you jump in. So that. just the logistics of that. So um, because sometimes um, students come late, like, or they're disconnected. And mm -hmm. once you put them in breakout rooms and you're visiting the breakout rooms, you don't always know that they're waiting. So it's, right. if your second device is, you just stay in the breakout room in your second device and you can visit the rooms. Is that how you make sure that you take care so of that? So my main computer that I use to show my slides and everything when we're in the main room, that one I leave in the main room. Okay. And then my second device, well, I don't have it here, but you know, you could use your phone. Yeah. I have a, I have a larger tablet that I use. 
Uh -huh. That one I send to the breakout rooms. Okay, cool. And so I talk to my students on the second device when they're in breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. That way I can easily see, and I have full controls because Android doesn't give you quite as many controls. Okay. Um, but I have full control with my Windows computer to be able to send students where they need to go and take care of any communication issues. Okay. Do make sure that you, if you have two devices in the same room, that um, one of them is muted. Muted, yeah. Off. Yes. But I've had that happen and students get really frustrated and there's no way for me to know that they're in like waiting and there's nobody there. So that's- Well, I mean, you can still see them. I mean, cause I-, I They're I in the waiting room. Them. They're in my waiting room. Oh, they're in your actual Zoom waiting room. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, for my classrooms, I have a password, but no waiting room. Mm -hmm. And I think that that makes a difference. Yeah, I have the opposite, <laughs> no password yeah. waiting room. Yeah, um, but when I make my breakout rooms, I always make one extra room and I rename it to office. That okay. way, if I need to take a student aside and speak to them privately, there's somewhere that I can do that. That's great advice. Thank you so much, guys. So anyway, yeah, so my, my teaching setup, I have dual screens. So I've got my laptop connected to an external monitor. And on my main screen, I usually launch my PowerPoint presentation. I do it in presenter mode so that my secondary screen, it's like the projector screen at the front of the classroom. So that's the one that I share with students. And then uh, PowerPoint lets you draw on your slides and act. I have a tablet computer. Well, I sh maybe I shouldn't call it a tablet piece. Of, I have a pen touch enabled computer that I draw over my PowerPoint slides with and students end up seeing all the writing on my slides. But I also put the student faces from Zoom on my primary monitor, the one that has my um, PowerPoint presentation in presenter mode. So not the one that I'm sharing with students. So that lets me see a few faces while I'm presenting, which makes it a lot easier to talk, right? Because when all you see is black screens, it feels like you're talking to yourself. So I like to be able to see at least a few student faces. And, you know, just like we have here, right? There's five of us with our videos on, and that's pretty typical for a class also, right? Maybe you only have two or three students. But if that's all you have, you still are seeing somebody looking at you. It, it feels a little more humanized. Um, and that way also, if somebody types in the chat window, I can open it up and see it on the screen. That is not where students are busy uh, looking at my presentation. I think the next couple of slides were you just kind of explaining some of these. Yeah, so I, I did some screenshots. So this is sort of what my primary screen ends up looking like. And there's my daughter's self-portrait. But you can see I have space okay. for the chat window, I have space for the uh, pictures, and I have my presenters. And then the next one, um, that's my secondary screen. So it's just the same slide that you saw on the previous one, but that's all that's shared. You can see the green ring around it indicating that it's shared by Zoom. And then my third screen is my tablet. And that's the one that I send to breakout rooms to talk to students. Okay. So please ask us any questions about the multiple screens as I get up our next slide here. Do you just log in with your secondary device the same as you would log in on your, in on your primary? Is that how you get both up? Yes, that's what I do. Um, I've more frequently been starting to get a message saying, you've been signed out on this device because you are signed into another one, but I've never been kicked out of the meeting even though I'm logging as the same one. If it ever becomes a problem, then what I'll just do is use my you know, free Zoom account that has a different email to log in. Okay, thank you. And actually, yeah, I was told that like if you have two monitors, I've never worked with two monitors, but I'd like to get that set up possibly that you could then put the students on one monitor. Is that something that you think you can do? Yeah, so Zoom actually does have a dual monitor option. I have not clicked that because um, I prefer to just drag my windows around where I want them. 
rather than ending up with certain windows stuck on certain screens. Second um, login, Tasha. So are you a co-host then? Like on your phone or whatever device you're using in your main computer, are you co-host so that you can move things around and be in control? Yeah, I think that the second one ends up being co-host, but I can't okay. remember right now. Okay. And I just, I just played with it and it worked. Okay. I think the second time I log in becomes co-host. Like I do that and the first one, whichever device I first I initiated the meeting and the other one becomes co-host. Well, don't you have a, didn't you have like a separate, you logged in as a separate person, didn't you, Tasha, when we were practicing? Um, yeah, so usually I just keep the same, um, my SDCCD login. Usually that's just the one that I use. If I ever run into trouble, I'll use my personal one. Uh, Michelle, but, give your hand yeah. up. Oh, it's, <laughs> for some reason I can't see that it says my hand is up. Um, this is gonna sound really like, like basic, but how do I do a second monitor on my laptop? Like, is it, yeah. So your laptop likely has some type of output. It might be HDMI, it might be VGA, but the same okay. way that you would hook up your laptop to be able to present in the classroom, you'd use that same connector and you just connect it to a monitor instead of to okay. the presentation screen. Which could also be a TV. Like it doesn't have to be a computer monitor. It actually could be a television now. Um, cause if you're using something like a, but how do you get, how do you get something different on the screen? The uh, so, oh, Yeah. So if you're on windows, if you type the windows key and then key, it will give you oh. the different options. So you can duplicate or you can extend. Okay. Or you can use just That's what you meant before when you said extend. Oh, I see. Right. Look at that. Okay. So you, you do extend. Much more real estate. Yes, I do extend. Okay. <laughs> almost <laughs> almost any time that I have a second monitor, I'm using extend. Okay. okay, so we've only just got about five minutes left. We had two more topics that you all had picked was um, asynchronous use of Zoom and then discussing whether or not to have students show their video. So in terms of asynchronous uses, Tasha and I kind of brought up two main points. One is using Zoom in your asynchronous classes for office hours. And the other is to provide a, essentially a workplace for students to have their own Zoom room. Um, so in terms of office hours, the idea is effectively you let your students know you're gonna be on Zoom at a certain amount of time or you have them schedule times with you and you use Zoom as your, as your office, right? So students can come and go um, and that's a really easy way to encourage students to interact with you uh, virtually face-to-face -face if you are teaching an asynchronous course. Um, Tasha, I'll let you talk about this in terms of like the meeting your instructor in the first two weeks thing. Yeah, so I've done a lot of online office hours from teaching fully asynchronous classes. And what I found is very few students wanted to hop on Zoom and things may be a little different now since most students are familiar with Zoom but I found that very few students were willing to hop on Zoom until I started requiring that they attend at least one meet the instructor session in the first two weeks. So really short meetings, like five to 10 minutes, I check in with them. Now I teach computer science. So one of the things I wanted to make sure is that they got all of the programs installed that they needed, that they were set up and that they were ready to go. Um, but other things you might wanna to talk to them about, do they know how to use Canvas? Do they know where to find things in your Canvas course? Because all of our Canvas courses look a little bit different. Um, do they have the textbook? Is there anything that they want to share with you? Like, hey, you know, I'm heading out of town for a friend's wedding in the last two weeks. Oh, well, let's talk about how we're going to make that work, right? And now they've had a chance to meet you, right? You're now human. You're not just this robot teaching the course. And they're a lot more likely to come back to office hours and actually ask you questions. And if you have a few meet the instructor sessions that multiple students come to, then they also have a chance to meet their classmates, which I think is really important in an asynchronous course. And I, I will add that um, from my experience, you know, I was offering office hours for an hour or 40 minutes or so. And students will come at the last minute. 
as well. So don't think that, oh, I said from, you know, 11 to 12 p.m., but oh, no one showed up in the first half hour, so I'll just go. <laughs> I've learned you can't do that because students, just like in our regular office hours, they will come at, you know, 11.55 um, to your office hours. So do keep that in mind that they, they view that whole time as you being there on Zoom. So accommodate, I found that an hour is a little too long for me to sit there kind of waiting. Um, it just gets me anxious. So I made my office hours a bit shorter, like 30 minute segments that I knew I could be there and be active and students could come in within that 30 minute segment. And I do think Tasha brought up the fact that in our asynchronous classes, I, I've had zero luck of getting students to attend office hours. So I'm actually gonna try her method of these short meetings. Um, different from my synchronous classes, students seem to be more comfortable already, probably because they've seen me in Zoom, feel more comfortable coming back to Zoom. So I think this idea of the short meetings to get your asynchronous students engaged will really help to get them used to coming to Zoom with you. Um, and the other piece that we had was um, opening up a Zoom room for students to use um, as a way for them to collaborate, because Tasha had mentioned that, you know, as they start to come to Zoom, especially in an asynchronous class, they can actually meet their classmates, maybe storm, you know, form study groups and things like that. So you can actually open up your Zoom room that allows students to access that without you being there. And that could be a really great tool for students to interact on their own without you having to always be present. And it's really similar to scheduling any other meeting. You just wanna make sure that it's a recurring meeting so you don't have to create a new one all the time. Um, I recommend generate, the auto, generate automatically for the meeting ID because you don't wanna give them your personal meeting ID. You wanna um, use a separate one. Um, it's optional to put a passcode in, but I like to put one in. And then in the advanced options, you might have to click to expand it. Click on allow participants to join anytime and then they can join without you being there. Um, do make sure that the waiting room is off though. And I see we have a question, do we have access to these slides? Yes, I linked to them from Catalyst. So uh, right around the link that you click to get to this presentation, you should be able to get to these slides. Um, and also since we didn't, we, we prepared a bunch of topics. So if there's some topics that you want to know more about that we didn't discuss today, our full set of slides are on that, that link on Canvas and you do have access to all of them. And so to, we just have um, like a minute left here. So the last question was um, whether or not we should require students to show their videos on Zoom. So I went and took the screen share down because effectively we thought we'd bring this forward as like a discussion about um, different opinions about whether you should require students to show their video on Zoom. Hey, uh, let's just get a, a quick show from everybody with the reactions, if you think yes or no. So, so yes, you should require students to show their videos or no, you shouldn't. So go ahead, put your opinion up there. And of course the opinions only last for like a second. Yeah. Now. Um, I'm not sure what you're seeing as participant. They change things around a little bit, but if I look in the participant window, I was actually getting a count of these as they were all appearing. So mm -hmm. I could, I didn't have to sort of count through or like, let's say we had a hundred people here. I would have been able to just see a consolidated number of people sort of voting for each one. So that's another quick way to do a poll as well. So it looked like the majority of people were saying no to not require. So any reasons why you think we should not require students to be on video? I don't want them to feel like they would rather skip class than be embarrassed. And, uh, I'm sorry, Alice, I, you kind of broke up a bit. I didn't catch all that. Oh, um, sometimes my students are at work and also I don't want them to be, I would hate to think they might skip class because they are too embarrassed of what's behind them or, or, or whatever coming across the video. Right, and so to counter that, Maureen's, Maureen's adding, um, it's hard to know if they are attending during the entire session, right, if their camera is not on. Um, some ways to maybe counter that, of course, are some of the active um, activities, things like the breakout rooms, using the annotate tool, those concept questions to get those students engaged. Yeah, Hannah suggests an exit ticket also. That's a good one. I've had students tell me that um, they were hiding from abusive situations or, uh, you know, uh, 
authorities or whatever. Uh, and so that's why they didn't want anything shown and they didn't put their name on. They had used a different name even. Um, so just a thought. Right. So I did just want to say we are a little bit after one o'clock. So if you do need to go, please, you know, don't let us keep you, but we'll stick around for a couple of minutes to finish this discussion for those of you that do want to stay. Go ahead, Tasha. So for me, what it comes down to is I don't know what a particular student's situation is. I don't know if there's something that they don't want to potentially have seen in the background of their video. Like uh, right now, I've got a background. Like my computer is powerful enough to put a background on, but not everybody is. And if I were to take my background off, you would see my laundry rack with um, a bunch of snow clothes drying on them. Um, I'm in Big Bear and I was shoveling snow right before we were here, right? But you guys don't want to see that and I don't want to show that to you. So I want to give students the option of having privacy. And so I ask students if they don't want to share a video to please make a personal Zoom account so that they can put at least their picture in, right? So that they look like that instead. But if they don't even wanna do that, that's fine. It's up to them. That's and I think Maureen, to, to get at kind of what do you do then, I, I really think a lot of it is just, it's working on having more active engagement with your students, which I mean, I, I teach classes of 45 to 50 students and that can be really hard. Um, but having those activities using things like Google Slides or Google Docs or putting them into breakout rooms. I have noticed that students are more apt to show their video or get on the microphone when they're in small breakout rooms with other students than they are in a class of 45 altogether. So I think there's kind of some workarounds to that and as opposed to a, a mandated required to show the video um, in, the, in the whole session. Any other thoughts? This, I mean, because I don't necessarily think there's a right or wrong per se. I think the district encourages us to um, not require it um, such effectively for some of the issues that we've brought up. But I think at some level, it does become a, a personal decision for your classroom and the type of classroom that you're trying to facilitate, right? So Maureen uh, asks, can we require students to write in the chat? I will say when I'm on my laptop, it's really easy to write in the chat. But sometimes I join like professional society meetings from my phone because I need to be able to wander around the house and keep my kids uh, on task with whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing. And it's really hard for me to be able to write a message when I'm on an Android device. Yeah, I just descended the last session here at Catalyst on my iPad and I could barely do the chat and listen to the talk because it all covers it. And so it is hard. You know, I, I was just thinking part of Tasha's whole idea of having students come to Zoom and do that 10 minute get to know you. These are the kind of things I think you could actually have a more frank discussion with your students about, hey, if you don't wanna show your video, ask them, how do they plan to participate in the class then? You know, that's where you could ask them, Maureen, can they use the chat session? They say, oh, I'm on my phone. And you might suggest, okay, could you actually, can you get a, a computer from, from, the, from campus, right? We have, we're still doing the computer program. Um, some things like that to essentially have that one-on-one -on -one with those students so you get to know why are they choosing not to put on their camera, right? They might not display that to the whole group, but they might talk to you about that one-on-one -on -one and you have more insight into what's really going on. I just wanted to add that um, there's just as many arguments for students to put their video on as there aren't. And um, I think it's good to I think it's important to encourage them if they're comfortable to share. And the reasons are because our teaching improves and their learning and engagement improves. On the flip side of that, my children are in high school and in high school, their teachers are barely requiring or encouraging them to. And I've gotten like emotional and learning responses from them. Like it was sad. Like I didn't wanna be the only one turning on my camera to say goodbye to my teacher I've had for over a year. And because the teacher is not encouraging that type of engagement, even when they go in their breakout rooms, and this is a senior, so that means they're really close to our students' age, and some of our students are going to be in that place. And they're not going to know that it will improve their learning. So they don't connect as much socially, and that is an area that we are all missing. And I think that we can protect their privacy, and we can be respectful of their needs and always make exceptions. But if we don't encourage them, if we don't set that, 
as this is why we're doing this because it's helpful for you. It's helpful for me. And it's going to be, it can, you know, we can all socially find a way to exchange something that we're missing. Then I know from what I'm hearing from my children, they're not going to do it because that's become the norm. And secretly they want to do it. Like they're not turning their cameras on because nobody's telling them to turn their cameras on because nobody's talking about the benefits of their camera and because they don't want to be the only one doing it. And even when they go in breakout rooms, they're not doing it. And they know perfectly well that it would help them. Do they, is it good that they have to turn their cameras off? Yes. Does it help with their privacy? Sometimes it does. I've, you know, my daughter has been sick and she's run into the bathroom and left her camera off and still listened. And I know that I engage less when my camera's off. So I assume that my students are pretty much doing exactly the same thing I am. So I, I think that we can encourage it and understand it's good for our teaching and it's good for their learning. And it's also really good for our heart. And it's good to just kind of remind our students, like you have a safe space. If you need to leave it off, you can leave it off but this is why we wanna leave it on. And there's some really good literature out there that supports both of those opinions. And I don't have the balance. I'm, I'm, tr I'm striving to f strike the balance, but we hear a lot more about like why we should keep it off than why we should keep it on. And I think that there is a good reason to keep it on and it's not punitive. It's also just to say, you know, because I wanna connect with you and I want you to feel connected. And I wanna I want see other faces during the day, not just the ones I live with. And the students do too. They, they're really, really, really happy that they've been able to see each other. Yes, I think that's a great point to keep to bring up. I've been reading more literature as you know, we've been taking more data about Zoom sessions that there's a bit of a peer pressure thing. That's different than we would think that when people don't put their videos on, the peer pressure is to not put your video on. And so the more students you can get engaged to show their faces, you will see more students feeling comfortable doing that because it becomes the norm, like you're saying, Dora, that becomes what you do, right? So I think, you know, that communication with students is key. I think bringing up exactly what Dora is saying, why do you want them to, you know, so they know what the actual purpose is that, that has to help. Michelle, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I was going to ask if anybody has um, experimented with offering incentives for keeping the camera on so that students can feel like because um, I think part of the peer pressure that they feel or the social pressure is that if they have their camera on, it's like they're showing off, right? And so if they have an incentive to, to say, well, I'm just, I have it on because I want to get some extra, you know, I want to get a, the point or whatever. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's It's been, and I, I actually did a survey uh, in my classes and asked them, you know, which, which, matches your view. Um, you will not turn your camera on. You don't like to turn your camera on, but you know it's the best thing for your learning. So you're willing to if everybody else does. You love having your camera on. You know, and almost everybody was in that middle category saying, yeah, I know it's better for my learning. I don't really like, you know, um, so I will if everybody else does. But still at the end of the class, everybody had them off. Michelle, I think that's a great idea to have a discussion with your students about why do you think you should have your camera on versus off, you know, and bring in the points that Dora was bringing up about how it helps with socializing. And I really liked what Dora said, you know, gee, I know that when my camera is turned off, I'm less engaged, right? If we can tell that to students as an instructor, we say, this is our experience. We know that your experience is likely to be similar let's think about it and let's make choices that are good choices for our learning. I yeah, also the problem I ran into is like, it was every class, you know, it was like every class I was having the same lecture and then it just started feeling kind of silly. And then by the end, nobody had their camera on. <laughs> was that your experience, Dora? I'm, I mean, most of my students do leave their camera on, but mm -hmm. I mean, I tried indirectly last semester to like encourage the importance of it by doing this whole cultural presentation about the value of body language, because I teach foreign language, I teach Spanish, yes. so they're like missing out on all of this language stuff. And so I taught them this whole lesson and the value of how we use our body to express ideas. And I said, oh, do you feel more encouraged to lose, leave your camera on now? And <laughs> I didn't, I mean, it was still just really mixed. I encouraged it, I didn't require it. I taught them how to use a virtual background immediately it was an exercise. Um, you know, I, I think that 
I know what I try to impress to my students is that I can't see your, this looks really boring look. I can't see your, I get it. I can't see your, I'm super confused look. And so if I can get a little bit more visual contact with that from more people, then I can get a better gauge because I really want to teach to where you are. So if you all look super bored, I can mix it up. But if you look really confused and I can't see your faces, I need, I need some gauge with that. And I don't want just one face because I only get one student. And if I get more faces looking like, what is she talking about? Then I can pull back. And that's at least the approach I'm trying in my, in my slides. I did not use any Zoom slides or Zoom etiquette last semester. And I had to pull some male students to the side, polite, politely tell them to put on a shirt you know, like you're making your female colleagues uncomfortable. And I even had a student, like I told him privately and he's like, oh, sorry about that. Let me put on my shirt. And I was like, I was not trying to call you out in front of everybody. So those are weird kind of things that I just decided, well, let me try that. I read some literature. Hannah shared a really interesting um, link with me as well. And see, I think it's what you said, Michelle. It's really interesting. Like they know it's better for them that they're not gonna do it. Like, what's the reward? I guess the reward is intrinsic. Like, I connect with you. I'm happy to see you. That's the that's what I tried the most last semester. Like, oh, look at you. Like, I tried a lot of those, like, visual um, compliments. Like, you look so nice and purple. You know, like, that helped them connect. Oh, did you cut your hair? Things that I would do naturally. But, like, ooh, I really, oh, I love your background. And try to tease some of it out with students who do a lot of backgrounds. Some of them are really cool with like, where are you now? I think I know where you are. Those kind of things help a little bit. Um, and I just want like communication. Somebody said communication is key. Like if you don't and you can't, I want to know. It's a hard, it's really interesting, Michelle, that like so many of them said that to you and then they didn't share it. I mean, it's very hard in language. I mean, I need some visual cues if you got it, so. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you know if that helps with my Zoom links. Well, this is a great discussion. I unfortunately need to go make sure that my kids are back on track with their afternoon <laughs> school work. So I'm going to say goodbye, but feel free to continue discussing. Thank you for everything, thank Stevie you. and Tasha. It's very helpful. Yeah, thank you all thank for you. coming. And I think that this conversation is so good to keep having. Um, and I think the more we can share the literature, I was actually just asking Hannah if she finds anything that she had. Hopefully we can share it either on the teaching tree because I would like to hear more of these discussions. I think the more we're online, we're going to figure this out. We are in the learning stages still, even though we've been doing online learning like this for a long time, really getting the full masses of us in it and engage with it. We're still in the process of learning. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, we can, the more discussions we have with each other and with our students, the better we're going to serve each other, right? So if a student is in Dora's class and they come to my class, that experience that you provide is going to help when they come to my class, right? So we can really help each other in that sense as well, I think. That's true. Definitely. Thank you right. very much. For well, your thank help. you so much for coming, everybody. Really nice to talk to you all and have a really great rest of your day. Thank Appreciate you. it.